I said we'd have a Jimbo day today, and indeed, I've got a couple of these short shows that he did in response to uh, things said on a show that was only on the channel for a little while. Um, We'll get to that. Um, I've got some driveling to do, and uh, I'm going to, as like the last time, uh, as I told you, I am uh, reading Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, an important philosophical work written by an emperor of Rome in his spare time uh, while he was out on military um, exercises at war, uh, so to speak. Even if you were destined to live 3,000 years or 10 times that long, nevertheless, remember that no one loses any life other than the one he lives, or lives any life other than the one he loses. It follows that the longest and the shortest lives are brought to the same state. The present moment is equal for all, so what is passing is equal also. The loss, therefore, turns out to be the merest fragment of time. No one can lose either the past or the future. How can anyone be deprived of what he does not possess? So, uh, yeah, it's an it's interesting meditation on the nature of uh, death and uh, the life that we live. Uh, and mourning, I mean, it's, we really have yet to really, as a species, learn to re- deal with the loss of death and I mean, it's going to happen, and the older I get, uh, well, all of us have experienced it in the last few years, but uh, the older I get, everybody I looked up to, everybody who, when I was coming up in the world and admired, and even those who I didn't admire, people I appreciated and inspired me, they've all either died, are dying, or uh, are going to, um, more and more, the older you get, the more of the people around you who are going to also die. And uh, that's something, I mean, yes, appreciate this time we have here because there is, who knows, uh, the afterlife, what happens after we go here. Um, your best assumption is nothing. Uh, but nobody can say. So, uh, yeah, appreciate the moments, appreciate the time you have with the people you care about, and uh, be, at least to me, be, I think we should definitely, instead of uh, getting angry or uh, upset with the people we care about when things go down, Remember, all this time is going by and you can't get any of it back. And any time wasted on needless um, fussing and uh, conflict, it, it's, it's silly. It really is. Um, and uh, it, yes, it, I, be, I know, I know, and I'm not the sort of person to uh, say later in the show and then make you wait till the very end. Um, so what we have is uh, two shows. Both were titled The Snake Tea Conspiracies. And uh, yeah, there was a show called The Snake Tea, which was hosted by Clara back in the days. And um, let's, let's check out Jimbo. Well, hello, everybody. It's Jimbo. How you doing? Uh, well, uh, this specific... Uh, Episode is going to deal exclusively with uh, conspiracy and conjecture in response to Clara and her snake tea number 32. Uh, she pretty much made the episode because I had asked her about what she thought about conspiracy, and I mentioned that so many people here on the Onsug are into conspiracy doesn't mean we all believe in the conspiracy. Obviously, there are some conspiracies that 
some of us do believe some of the theories. As you pointed out, that's a good good point you made that these are theories and not all theories are correct. We know this. However, uh, some conspiracies are certainly true. Most are certainly incorrect. There may be some truth to some things that are said, but I'd say at least 99% of conspiracies are at least partly incorrect. That doesn't mean that we should not pay attention to conspiracies. I heard you say that you thought they were a waste of time or whatever. Well, you know, I can understand uh, your point of view. I can understand that, and I can understand why people think that people that are that follow conspiracies are crazy. I understand that. I know a lot of people that follow conspiracies that I feel that they're kind of nutty. There are definitely some conspiracies that I feel are true, or at least partly true. That's the whole thing with the conspiracies is there's generally enough wrong with a conspiracy for you to, or for the average Joe to poo-poo it. Yet, uh, there's also usually enough true with it that it can't be completely dismissed. The thing is, is there's there's probably a little bit of truth in almost every th- conspiracy theory you hear. Like the JFK thing. I hear stuff all the time that's completely false. And that movie that was made by Oliver Stone, most of that is made up baloney. It just didn't happen. He got a little bit of new information, and he took it and he ran with it, and he made a movie. It's a movie. doesn't mean anything. Just because something's based on something. I don't know. The the little bit of truth out there is is worth exploring. doesn't mean you have to believe the whole theory. Don't just take the word of somebody that says something about conspiracies and whatnot. Go and look. And find out for yourself. You'll see that there's a little bit of truth. At least behind every one of these uh, theories. And some of them will take you on longer rabbit trails than others. And you know, for the most part, I like conspiracies. Because they're entertaining. They're they're a lot like a, a puzzle. Or perhaps a, uh, a story. You know, a book. Uh, and... They're just entertaining for the most part. Just because somebody follows conspiracies doesn't mean they're a nutcase. Doesn't mean they're right. Doesn't mean they're wrong. Maybe they just like to be entertained by either something they feel is ridiculous or something they feel has a little bit of truth and uh, kind of draws you in, you know, like... uh, Hey, you know, I never really knew that before. Um, There's a lot of conspiracies that may seem not real on the surface that you can go back and check through time that you can find out were absolutely true that will blow your mind. And you think, uh, wow, I had no idea. So, anyway... I, for one, appreciate you jumping on this topic and answering it. And I'm answering you back because uh, why not, right? Why not? So, thanks, Clara. And thanks to everybody else that listened. Have a good one. We'll see you a bit later. And did you notice? Even Jimbo was appreciating. Wait, it's 2015. Uh, we're still in. I, I'm going to play a lot of Jimbo as this program goes on because he was definitely a fellow appreciator, a digger in the uh, terminology of Gene Shepard, one who digs 
things, and uh, and and also does a little digging. Uh, so uh, both, and and indeed, I, I agree with him. I mean, the the two biggest conspiracies I can think of off the is the JFK one, which I go around in circles and round and round, and at the end of the day, it's yeah, Lee Harvey Oswald shot. JFK and all of that other stuff and the alternate Zapruder for all the just evidence it's just it's fascinating but none of it conclusively makes me think anything other uh, than that yeah JFK uh, is that that's what happened RFK's uh, assassination might be a different story but that's not a big deal conspiracy theory nobody talks about the rfk assassination uh jfk's brother who was killed uh during his campaign for president in 1968 and the other uh conspiracy that i and this one i wish it were true i would love for the roswell story to be a true story I was just recently in Roswell at the museum with the liminaries, and we were talking about it after. And indeed, it's fascinating, like Jimbo said, to speculate and listen to other people speculate and read all these things and listen to these radio shows and experts. And But the bottom line is, really, for all of the so-called evidence there's no evidence. There's nothing besides this bizarre speculation that, uh, once again, uh, there's some sort of phenomenon as far as just in general UFOs. But other than that, who knows? Who knows what it is? And uh, as I like to say, UFO is a very apt term, and people forget the word you means un identified that means you're not identifying it as a flying saucer from outer space you're saying you don't know what that is and there are 100 percent i can agree and uh, yeah and then a couple days later jimbo released this hey it's jimbo this is a uh, kind of a response to snake t number 36 uh people 50 plus years old Clara did a podcast on the 8th of November and I thought I would uh, talk back to that she asked specifically uh, what I thought about uh, people that are uh, around her age which is I guess about uh, 23, 24 you know I have a niece that's about your age she just graduated college. I'm not sure exactly how old she is. Uh, I guess she's actually 25. And uh, she started a year late, but uh, she graduated college. I I know a lot of her friends that are about your age. And I don't know, you know, as a, a American kids are probably a lot different than uh, the kids over there in uh, the east. I guess Australia is in the east. It's not really the east, but it is really sort of kind of, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's west, but it's east. How can it be? It's two. It's two. It's two continents in one. Uh, uh, I guess uh, Australia is, is west, but uh, then again, you're east, so I don't know. Anyway, I think it's, uh, I don't know, we, uh, the kids today are just totally different than the when I was that age, I mean, completely different, I guess everybody can say that, but uh, they're definitely different. Uh, by the time I was 24, for example, I had been already married two years, and, uh, uh, working hard and uh, I know a lot of kids your age especially around here in this country that uh, are not working at all and they're still living with mom and dad I don't understand that don't get it at all I mean uh, when you're that age you should be out on your own and otherwise I mean uh, 
you're going to find it very hard if something happens to mom and dad all of a sudden and you're, you know, 27, 28 years old and you're out on your own. Uh Uh-oh. What do I do now? Well, (laughs) you better start swimming. That's what you're going to do. You better start swimming or you're going to drown. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, I always think, when I think of the kids your age, I think, these rotten kids, blah, blah, blah. And then, I actually talk to some of them at the store, you know, and they're not impolite. Uh, they're respectful. They're, uh, uh, they're, they've been courteous to me and they like me and, uh, treat me like a human being and rather than a piece of trash. So I really can't say anything negative, uh, other than the fact that I hear a lot about kids that just aren't working and, uh, aren't being productive and aren't doing anything, just sitting around goofing off doing absolutely nothing. I don't think that's cool for mom or dad that's taking care of them. But other than that, I mean, uh, you guys are way smarter than we were, and uh, at least you have the technology to be way smarter. You seem to be like you're right on top of the ball, Clara. So, uh, and I do understand the fact that You know, you don't like calling older people by their first name. There's this uh, person I know, and I've known them for five years on the Internet. And this person's the same age I am, roughly. And uh, this person's female, but they grew up uh, not saying the name of somebody's first name. They call them by their last name, or they they don't call them anything. And so she doesn't call me anything. And when I uh, talk to her via email or whatever, she never addresses me by my name. And even though I mentioned it before to her, hey, you know, what, what's the deal? Still doesn't address me by my name. And she, I just realized she's just not going to do that because that's the way she was brought up. And I find it kind of strange, but... Uh, that's the way she was brought up, and I understand it's a respect thing, and uh, and it's a it's a lot of other different things. It's not necessarily respect, but you know it's it's in that line, and definitely the way people were brought up. Just like if I talk to a woman that I don't know that, um, you know, if she's even a even a halfway decent age, I mean, you know, thirty ish or whatever. When I talk to her, I just say yes, ma'am, to them. And that's just the way I, I do things. And so, uh, and yes, sir, to, you know, the people I talk to, I just I just do it. Uh, that's the way I was brought up. And so, I don't know. Pretty cool. But your, uh, your latest, uh, number 36, was really awesome. Uh, you seem to be way more open and cool and stuff and uh, funny as I stated so uh, keep up the good work keep up the good work I enjoyed this Uh, anything you got to say back uh, go ahead it's cool anybody want to jump in jump in it's okay nobody's going to bite you alright take care Oh, that Jimbo, full of interesting digressions. And, and, and yeah, that's uh, 2015, just a couple days after the last one. Um, and yeah, people's calling people by their first names, older people, is just, to me still, you know, I, I came, it, it was changing as I came up, and I was about, I am about the same age Jimbo was. So, yeah, there were certain older people who were always, you know, Mr. Such and Such or Miss or Mrs. Such and Such. There was Mrs. Coddington across the street, and you waved and you said, hello, Mrs. Coddington, and she would go, hi. And I, to this day, I have no idea what her first name was, and I never would have thought to ever address her. I mean, older people, uh, I, even when they told you, oh, you can call me Bess. No, uh, you're Mrs. Whatever. Um, it, it just, it was weird. 
then I guess this is hammered into us as manners or being polite or just the conventions of the time. And uh, people who call their parents, especially directly to their face, much less, you know, they're referring to their mom or dad, and they call them, you know, Joe or Muriel or Edna. I mean, you just don't, I don't know. Um, I don't think my kid and my son, who is a legend in his own mind, has ever referred to me by my, and I, I don't know. I would feel kind of weird. And what's even weirder is as I get older, people calling me sir. That just weirds me out completely, but I, I, I do it. At people who are older, who I don't know their name, or even if I do maybe have learned their name, unless they said, oh, you can call me Walter. It's sir and ma'am, although ma'am has, I don't know, a woman's lib connotation that came on that, you know, I, I'm not, it, it's always awkward anymore. There, there used to be very firm um, conventions that were used, and it was fine doing things that way, but not anymore. And uh, something else I appreciate. Let's move along, if we will. There will be, by the way, more Jimbo. And let's just say, in our next episode, I'm going to treat you to Jimbo's favorite old-time radio show, an episode of Vic and Sayd. So... I look forward to that and make sure you tune in. Um, I'm going to talk about a band that for the longest time was probably my favorite band. Um, I first heard about them through their third album. I read a review in Cream Magazine, which in my day, uh, that and maybe Trouser Press were, there was no internet. They were, I, I never, Rolling Stone was always just a little like, the popular, popular stuff that you'd already, by the time they reviewed it, uh, you'd already heard it and you knew and they were like confirming or being argumentative to how I feel about something. But uh, Cream would introduce new bands in Trouser Press, especially over the years, introduced me to a lot of great music. But uh, around 1979, uh, I was reading, and I read a review of an album called Drums and Wires by a band called XTC. And the review itself sold me the album. I went right out and got it, and I just loved the album. That, that was the album. You may have heard the song Making Plans for Nigel. Uh, that was their first. It wasn't a big hit, but... It was on the radio, and once I played the album, I recognized it. But the song was full of this wonderful, quirky pop, full of what they call hooks, little earworms, little touches that catch your ear, and just a really upbeat, poppy punk sound. Not too punk and not too pop. And they had two albums before that I found out rather quickly that were only released in the UK and you had to order these things. I ordered their first two albums, uh, White Music and Go To. Now these were different because the first two albums they had an organ player named Barry Andrews who later formed a band called Shriekback, but that's a completely other story. But they were just this crazy power punk pop that I really enjoyed and some of my older friends thought it was a little too much. Although over the years, they came, a lot of my friends came to enjoy them. And by the time their next album came out, Black Sea, um, I was in full swing going into Manhattan and buying all their import singles with the picture sleeves and just waiting and waiting for another single or another album. And then they came out with the double album English Settlement, which was just a masterpiece of a combination of punk pop, progressive, uh, Beatlesque melodies. Uh, Andy Partridge, who throughout the thing was the main songwriter, just has this wonderful touch for writing these clever and catchy pop songs. And uh, 
English settlement. Uh, I would recommend it to you to this very day, uh, an incredible album. And uh, my cousin and I were going, we got tickets, we were going to see them live on tour. And unfortunately, uh, right in the middle of that tour, before they came to Jersey, we were supposed to see them in Passaic, New Jersey. They, it, it was a case of, of stage fright so severe for Andy Partridge that he really, to this day, has never gone out on a stage with a band and performed again. Uh, Later on, they were one of the first bands to do an unplugged set a few years later, but they became a studio band at that point, and I remained a fan. They came out with their next album, Mummer, which, while not as good as as their other albums, it was fun and catchy. And uh, also the next one, The Big Express, not as good as the earlier albums, in my opinion, but nonetheless, incredible pop albums with some great songs and well worth listening to. And in fact, in recent re-listens, they're even better than I remember them. Uh, I used to, there's slower songs. I used to be more into the upbeat stuff. But as I'm getting older, I am developing quite an appreciation for the mellower sounds of a lot of bands who I would skip songs on their albums because it's just a little too placid, just a little too laid back. Um, But then they they came out with an album under a pseudonym called The Dukes of Stratosphere was the name of the band, and it was called 25 O'Clock, where they were one of the first bands to go back and record songs that sounded like they were made in the 60s during the psychedelic era. And eventually they would have two albums like that, but uh, 25 O'Clock was the first one. Uh, After that, they teamed up with another of my favorite musicians, producers, Todd Rundgren, and made an album called Skylarking, which many consider to be their best album ever. Just a fabulous album full of wonderful songs, and that uh, has another song that you might have heard called Dear God that was kind of controversial and possibly still is, but after that, they came out with another Dukes of Stratosphere album, Psonic Sunspot, both of the words spelt with a P at the beginning to be psychedelic, I suppose. And uh, then a couple more albums, Oranges and Lemons, another double album of uh, pretty good songs. Not as good as Skylarking, um, not as good as English Settlement, but maybe better than Mummer or The Big Express. And then None Such, which the more I listen to it and the older I get, the better crafted and wonderfully written and put together this album turns out to be. And then in 1992, after that album, they went on strike with their record label, which was owned by Richard Branson, because they felt they weren't being properly paid or uh, remunerated for their efforts. And they remained on strike for seven years years, lost all their momentum, and uh, then they came out with two more albums, Apple Venus Volume 1 and Apple Venus Volume 2, Wasp Star, which, again, really, really great albums that age like wine. Uh, The older these albums get, the better they are. And then it was over. Uh, Andy Partridge uh, has compiled all kinds of demos, done some solo stuff, but that was the end of the ride to this very day. And uh, the bass player who wrote some of the songs, just he's not interested in putting the band back together. Hence, I don't think they ever will get back together. But XTC is a band that I would say you and whatever. I mean, if you like pop music, if you like the Beatles, if you like progressive music, if you like a little punkiness, you will appreciate uh, XTC. No matter which of these albums you pick up, 
Um, the earlier ones, like I say, White Music and Go To, are pretty raw and upbeat, but uh, they still have wonderful hooks and great songwriting. And the rest of the catalog is just awesome, awesome sauce. And uh, I think, I, it, it, I, what, what time does the little clock say? Yeah, we, 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 we timed that uh, just about right. And I appreciate the comments. We got another comment that uh, I will uh, probably discuss the next time around. And, and indeed, leave comments. Let me know what you think. Let me know your ideas. And uh, again, take your time. Listen to these shows when you can. Uh, there's nothing I'm going to say, I believe, that will be time sensitive and you'll miss anything. Um, it's just appreciation. So, till next we meet, like I say, set the controls for the heart of the fun.